Okay. Back with it again. Something over here. So nothing to learn from that. <coughs> the items I missed up there. Nope. Alright, down the next level. Just gonna go through talk to everyone in the city. Beautiful. Make sure I've got any quest things with any of them. Good days and clear skies. Right, Cena smiles. See you. Uh, check in here. Here we go. I learned something new from this one. Publishing funded by the Brotherhood of Crusader Adherents. Remember, Crusader, your foes are many, and each one is devious in its own way. In the lands of the World Wound, two demonic masters rule, learn to distinguish their influence and their followers. Discari is a demon lord who commands locusts and other crawling pests. It is an all-devouring wave that sweeps away all that is bright, majestic, and pure, leaving behind nothing but decay and ashes. For a hundred years, this evil fiend and his lackeys have been sowing death <coughs> and suffering all across Gularion, sending one horde after another through the world wound and onto our plane. Discari's visage is hideous, for his essence is a horrid crossbreed of humanoid and insect, and behind his back are fluttering wings woven from swarms of insects. Born of two demons, Discari despises both his brethren that were once mortal and his own human followers. Knowing of this disdain, the cleverest of his cultists seek ways to transform themselves into full-blooded demons, and to this end, they attempt some of the vilest experiments on their own flesh. Discari has been behind the horrors of the world wound ever since its creation. However, the other demon lord, Baphomet, joined him only at the onset of the Third Crusade. The goat-headed demon lord is cunning and slippery, and where his unholy kin makes his way through brute force, Baphomet prefers deceit, corruption, and backstabbing. Many noble houses trying to preserve their veneer of exalted dynasties keep to the worship of Baphomet as a family tradition. In truth, the cultists who call themselves Templars of the Ivory Labyrinth are searching day and night for weaknesses in the Crusader ranks, a doubtful mind to corrupt, a wavering heart to break, an ember of cowardice to fan. Beware of the cultists of Baphomet, for they might be standing next to you, looking over your shoulder and laughing at what you are reading. Okay, no enemy, Crusaders believe. So we had a plus one on perception and stealth check, was it?
I can handle it. No loot out here. Can't make the demons wait. From the on any then. One book. Yeah, let's learn something from. They steal other people's stuff. What can I just dead a own? I never robbed a living soul, but why do corpse need gold? And they ki kicked me to death. The scoundrels would they think they didn't find my stash under the eastern wall? Okay. Let's see what we can do. Eru a Shaylee's ruby eyes stare watchfully at passersby, who don't notice her even at arm's length. She turns to you, her face a mixture of contemplation, sadness and admiration. They're amazing, aren't they? Uh, we are being attacked by demons with unusual power. Do you know anything about them? Eru Ashali thinks for a long while. Finally, she answers hesitantly. Back in Alushinara, there were rumors about terrible experiments that Baphomet and Discari performed on their troops to make them stronger. Here on the material plane, these rumors were embellished with lots of details. Some say the demons undergo rituals acquired from Zonkuthan. Others say they feed on the blood of angels, or Klipoths, or demon lords. Still others say that there are no experiments, and Baphomet is just bringing back fighters from the future, a future in which the demons have already taken all of Gularion. Is there a grain of truth in any of these ramblings? There's no way to know. Naturally, none of these rumors give any indication of where these demons come from. I'm sorry I can't help. The only thing that's clear is that the lowly fighters in the army of the Abyss are as puzzled by this as we are. What are you doing here? I'm watching. She nods at the city dwellers as they hurry past. I'm listening to their conversations, studying their faces. I'm trying to understand what they truly are.
Have you learned anything new about mortals? They love cats. Erua Shaley speaks in a very serious manner, as if sharing an important scientific discovery with you, but then a moment later she smiles to give the joke away. Okay. Um. Uh. Seriously, have your observ observations of humans led to anything? I wouldn't want to draw any rash conclusions. I've only been watching them for a short while. But I think I have understood one thing. The succubi have a saying, mortals always lie. If a mortal isn't talking, it means she's busy lying to herself. But now I see this isn't true. You mortals aren't liars. You're dreamers. Each of you creates a huge daydream for yourself, and everyone you share your life with. It isn't exactly a lie, because the daydream is your truth. Why do you like watching people? You know, when I, in my old life, I thought I knew everything about them. I was a master of seduction, after all. I knew how to tempt a mortal into doing anything I required. I could trap them in a lie, or lie myself and never get caught. It's disgusting to remember, but that was my life for many centuries. Now I see I knew nothing. A demon warrior probably also considers himself an expert on mortals because he's killed so many of them. He certainly knows where to thrust the spear for a quick death, and where to thrust it for a long and painful one. And he thinks that's enough. My knowledge, it was of the same kind. I ruined many mortals without learning the first thing about them. Now I watch them to understand them. This won't give my victims back their lives, of course. But still, by growing closer to these mortals, it's like I'm paying back some part of my debt to my victims' memories. Don't you think you're being a little creepy? What? The succubus blinks, surprised. Really, why? I don't mean any harm. I see, let me ask you another question. Of course. Uh, tell me but about But forgive your... me if I don't have any answers. Tell me about yourself. I'm afraid you won't like what I'm going to tell you. Where did Succubi come from? Did you have a childhood? No. Well, yes but, in brief, the Abyss is nothing like the mortal world. Erua Shaley makes a gesture in the air, trying to find the right words. You remember life since conception? No, wait, you don't remember that part, do you? But certainly you know everything since birth. We do not. Normally, when a human dies, the Lady of Graves decides which plane they go to. Most often, those who arrive in the Abyss turn into larvae, you know, the little worms no one notices until you step on them. They crawl in the mud for centuries, devouring each other, and the strongest ones turn into demons. I don't know how that transformation happens. Maybe we hatch out of them, like caterpillars out of butterflies. No, wait, it's the other way around. Or maybe greater demons sculpt us out of them, like so much clay. I don't know what happened to the larvae that they used to make me. And my own memory. It begins with vague, fragmentary images. Terrors, executions, orgies. I remember some poor lad half gnawed by the larvae. He was crying and begging to be killed. And I pointed at him, and laughed, and said I wouldn't. Deesna forgive me, I'm so ashamed. How did you end up turning against the abyss? Temptation. Erua Shaley smiles sadly. Strange, isn't it? So many people believe that being good is important, but it's boring and unpleasant and all that's enjoyable and tempting pertains to evil. 
Even the servants of kind gods often think so, do they not? You have no idea how easy that makes the role of a temptress. Well, it was my great fortune to discover that it's not always like that. My last. Erua Shaili looks away. My last victim was a priestess of Desna, the tender of dreams. As you know, demons do not sleep. Mortals always compare their greatest moments to dreams. So I decided it would be interesting to see for myself, and while I was at it, forgive me, goddess, to mock Desna. This priestess lay in my arms, dying of my kiss. I, I remember every smallest detail, the cold sweat on her skin, her eyes rolled back into her head, her weak whisper. It's so difficult to recount. Well, I dove into her mind to see what mortal dreams were like. But the goddess saw me in her realm. And, it turned out, I remained there far longer than I planned. What did Desna do to you? As a punishment, she gave me. Mercy. I often think, why me? She could easily have blown me away like smoke, with the flick of her finger. The gods rarely trouble themselves with the lives of mortals, and even less so with demons. But for reasons of her own she paid me special attention. She awoke in me the memories of the sinners whose souls were used to create me. All those humans. I knew nothing of them until Desna showed me. Each of them had their own dreams. And a world without pity trampled each of them and placed them on a path that led to the abyss. Their memories. All their hopes and pain. I'm sorry, it's hard for me to talk about this. You see tears well up in the succubus's eyes. Erua Shaili wipes away her tears and continues. The most important thing I realized was that every mortal is a little world of hopes and dreams. And that although I, I might be a succubus, I didn't have to live forever with those beastly, boring pleasures and tortures of the abyss. I can be free. I, I can be myself. If only I can understand who I am. You don't know who you are? What of you? Do you know who you are? Are there many mortals who can make that claim? Before returning me to the mortal realm, Desna whispered something to me. I can still hear her words. She asked me, and what do you dream of? And I, I don't know. I still don't. You see, demons are simple creatures. Erua Shaili purses her lips. Each is guided by two or three strong sins. Before my conversion, my sins were all I was. A ball of desire without anyone behind them doing the desiring. Desires for sex, for flattery, and food. But now I have me. And, and, it's amazing but it's so complicated. Erua Shaili makes an apologetic gesture and smiles. What did you do after Desna converted you? I traveled. In the beginning, I thought it wise to keep away from demons and their temptations. Run off to Absalom, or perhaps even further, to another plane. But then I realized that I didn't deserve freedom yet. The abyss was still in me. It called to me, tempting me, seducing me. If I ran away, I would soon return to my old habits. Erua Shaili forces the word from her mouth. That is why I came here, to join the war. To remember who my enemy is. To defeat the demons, not just for the mortal world, but for myself as well. Because if I don't kill my past, it will always be reaching for me. I'm a wonderful liar. I'm no longer proud of it, but it's still true. The demons never suspected my treason until the very end. I lived as a spy, and regularly reported back to the priests of Desna whatever I learned. Naturally, I concealed my identity from them as well. I would never have been caught, but when I learned that Discari was planning an attack on Kenabras, there was no time for caution. I risked everything to warn you, and paid with my freedom. Uh, thank you for not running from the evil but confronting it.
Yes, I'm glad I did. But, you know, it's hard. Evil calls me back. Every day. And when it's so close, what if one day I grow tired of fighting? They worship Desna now. The goddess did a lot for me. More than I ever deserved. Asking anything more of her would be impudent. I'm grateful to her, but I try not to trouble her with my prayers. Uh, thank you for your answers. I hope they didn't upset you too much. At least not as much as they upset me. Uh, it's pretty depressing anyway, uh, but... Um, okay, let's ask the next thing. Uh, may I ask you a personal question? The kind of question a mortal might ask a succubus? You want to talk about sex? Erua Shaley looks you in the eye. Ask me anything, I'll not keep secrets from you. But don't expect to hear anything light-hearted or pleasant. Uh, the kiss of a succubus is deadly, isn't it? Not just the kiss. Any caress, of any kind, sucks the life from mortals. And there's nothing I can do about it. Erua Shaley touches her lips ever so slightly. For mortals, tenderness is tenderness and violence is violence. But I don't know what it's like to kiss and not inflict pain. I just hope my observations of mortals will help me understand. Young lovers, old spouses, even what mortals condemn as promiscuity, to me it all looks like something amazingly human. Hmm. Uh, we'll go the romantic thing with it. Um, don't know if we'll go very far, but... Uh, you know, a drop of vital energy is a small price to pay for your kiss. Don't joke like that. For me, it's not a joke at all. Uh... I'm not kidding, I can... Easily spare a bit of vital energy for the sake of a kiss. Erua Shaley's cheeks blush faintly. Her lips open a little, and she wets them with the tip of her tongue. Sighing deeply, she answers with apparent effort, I never want to feel such pleasure again. Not with anyone, ever. If I kiss anyone, I want to be sure that the kiss brings us both pleasure, not pain. Erua Shaley's voice grows soft, and you barely hear her words. I should like to kiss someone again, but only as a mortal, not as a demon. Okay. Uh... Wait, you mean you don't just watch people during the day in the streets, out in the streets? Well, I never touch anyone. I never harm anyone, I just watch and listen. Is that... bad? Um... Uh, we'll go with the lawful one, I guess. You must respect others' privacy. Please restrict yourself to observing people in public. If you say so. I'm sorry if I did something wrong. I haven't quite figured out how mortal life works. What is sex between demons like? Everything demons do is a sort of cannibalism. Each devours mortals and other demons in their own way. Some enjoy literally tearing off pieces of flesh with their teeth. Others like to subdue and turn their prey into slaves and living tools. Some feed on others' humiliation. It comes in different forms, but the essence is always the same. Another being is an object to be used for your own pleasure. Demon sex doesn't differ from any other type of violence. In my former life, it was something I did to others, or others did to me. Only one person ever received pleasure, not the other. Do you feel, still feel desire? Erua Shaley keeps a long silence, as she searches for the right words. I, you see, on the one hand, my succubus nature remains with me. I feel, the desire I feel is the one from my old life. When I look at any mortal, I immediately imagine how, she looks away. But that feeling, that desire, it's not what mortals feel. 
When you like someone, you don't ponder how good it would feel to drink their soul, do you? You think about how good it would feel to be together. Together, you see. You know how to want someone, and at the same time, not want to destroy them. For me it's always one and the same. True despairings in Arua Shaylee's voice. I'm not even talking about love. Just the common mutual affection of mortals, when they're not poisoned with violence. Now I know that I've never felt it. It's hard to imagine how it's even possible. Thank you for being so open. Erua Shaylee nods without saying a word. Hmm. Tell me about life in the abyss. I can't tell you about all of the abyss, I've only seen a small part. If you like, I can tell you about the Midnight Isles and Alushinara. Tell me about the Midnight Isles. In the ocean of Ishia, not far from the mouth of the river Styx, there is a chain of islands. This is the realm of Nocticula, the queen of the succubi. There is no sun there, only a moonlit night, alternating with a moonless one. Each of the islands is one of Nocticula's trophies, the remains of a powerful entity that perished at her hands. As you see, you cannot take a step in the abyss without treading on corpses. Tell me about Asherero. The Porphyry City is Nocticula's capital. There's no city like it in the mortal world. Absalom is a village in comparison. Millions, I don't exaggerate, millions of demons and mortals live there. Some come voluntarily, not only from Gularion, but from other planes as well. Nocticula keeps an open boundary, and enjoys having many guests, merchants, and travelers in the city. Some arrive in chains. The slave trade is the most thriving business in the city. From afar, the city may seem a merry place. Many of its dwellers do enjoy themselves, until it's their turn to become someone else's toy. It's a city of suffering, Lunacal. Of cheerful, festive torments that everyone in the city inflicts on those around them. What are some places of interest in... Ab yeah. The heart of the business quarter is the flesh markets, where the slave trade takes place. I grew up in the mansion of Lady Velixia. Her house is always full of guests doing their best to entertain her. Those whose performance is not to her liking risk remaining at her house forever. The main attraction of the Succubi City is, of course, the brothels, the 10,000 delights. I need not tell you what they offer, if you can imagine it, someone is selling it. Not far from there you can find the Harem of Ardent Dreams, which serves as a sort of city hall. Shumra, Nocticula's right hand and mayor of Alushinara, receives her visitors there. For those who prefer bloodier sport, there are many arenas in the city. The most famous of them is Battle Bliss. Battles run continuously, without breaks and without rules. It doesn't matter what trickery you use to win, it only matters how much fun the crowd is having. And above it all towers the House of Silken Shadows, Nocticula's Palace. Hundreds, thousands of towers and domes, adorned with jewels. There are legends of what happens inside. Many have striven to experience the delights of the Succubi Queen's Palace forgetting that it was built for her pleasure, not theirs. What can you tell me about Noctura? Noctura? She's called the Lady in Shadow. They say that she was the first succubus. She's far from the most powerful of the Demon Lords, but this hasn't kept her from being the ruin of many creatures significantly more powerful than herself, even building her kingdom upon their bones. They say that, like Lamash too, she strives to turn herself from a demon lord into a true goddess. Like Lamash, yeah. Okay. She enjoys killing, but her favorite tools are seduction and deception. She only stoops to crude violence when there are no other games to play, and even then she backstabs from the shadows. Her favorite weapon is a crossbow, though a silk garret would suit her better. Hmm. 
If you should ever meet her, do not believe a word she says, and do not fall for her provocations. Do not try to beat her at her own game. And most importantly, remember, the worst mistake anyone can make is to underestimate her. Thanks for your information. I'll be happy if it helps. What do you think of the powers I gave you? It's a great temptation. I don't know if I should be trusted with such power. I certainly wouldn't trust myself with it. When you have so much power, it's easy to decide you're a god and the mortals are your toys. Perhaps I should wait until after we defeat the forces of the Abyss. Home. But that's precisely what these powers are for. She thinks for a moment, then speaks softly. You take a great risk. I'm not sure I can handle the temptation. It's hard enough as it is. I have to go. I will be watching you. Um, is there anything else? Drawing her ruby eyes away from the passersby, Erua Shaili looks at you. It's good that you're here. Shall we be silent together? Do you like the silence? I used to talk a lot before, and all of it was a lie. My words ruined so much. I like silence more now. I will be watching you. Erua Shaili. I will be watching you. A woman in gold embroidered cleric's robes greets you with a polite bow. Her eyes, the color of molten gold, gleam brightly in her dusky face. Greetings, Commander. My name is Arsino. I am a messenger from the Temple of Abadar in Absalom, and I came here assuming the defenders of the fortress could use the services of a cleric. Perhaps you've heard of the wound that sometimes opens on my chest. Are you familiar with this kind of an, a, uh, ailment? Arsino quickly probes you with the skill of an experienced healer. So the wound was right here. And then it disappeared. And reappeared. Amazing. No, this is the first time I've ever heard of such magic. What do you think it might be? I think it is some kind of demonic corruption, or particles of chaos from the abyss have entered through the wound into your body and made it so... unstable. It sounds quite interesting, incidentally. Judging from the records of researchers of the abyss, stranger things have happened in this cursed place. Can you give me some advice on how to heal it? I am sure that you have already used the purification and chaos warding spells. And for obvious reasons, you do not have the option of leaving the campaign and going on a long pilgrimage to various shrines. Since that's the case, keep a diary. Make careful and systematic entries about your well-being. If it gets worse, record the circumstances under which it happens. I'm afraid this is the only advice I can offer right now. Mm. I want you to try and heal me. I'm sorry, but I do not have the right to do that. A healer who makes a blind attempt to heal a patient who is not on the verge of death is an irresponsible fool. You do not seem to be dying, so we will not take any unnecessary risks. Ah, uh, thank you, it will make sense to me now. Take care of yourself, Commander. Uh, that is precisely that? why I am here. Oh, alright, well, what do you got here anyway? Um, that's a crimson ring. A con man, okay. Um,
recipe. Expensive. I already have that out, bloody hell. Um, why'd this sell it to me again? How can I help you? Uh, what service do you provide? I can sell you various divine spell scrolls. Even if you don't have anyone in your party who can read them, I'll be happy to read it for you right here. However, take care out there on your travels. A scroll is useless without someone who can read it. To use a scroll while you're on the move, you will need a spellcaster whose magical training covers such spells, or someone skilled in magical devices. Tell me more about a badger. What? Who? I'd be delighted to. A bardar is the patron Abada. deity of law, trade, and the prosperity of cities. He teaches that law and order allow civilization to develop and keep people safe and wealthy. Iomade and Abada are allies, since Iomade also holds order and nobility above all else. It's hardly surprising to see so many mighty fortresses and wonderful cities in Mendev bloom under her blessing. How did you end up in Dresden? My story has grown longer and longer over the years, yet, sadly, it never gets any more interesting. I was born and raised in Absalom. Soon I realized that bringing the word of Abada to places where it's already been heard was too easy a challenge for a cleric like me. I have traveled all across Gularion since then, watching civilization bring enlightenment to the wildest of places. This brings joy to my heart and makes me feel like I serve my god with my deeds and not only with my words. The tiny barony in the stolen lands that had been my home for a very long time eventually turned into a strong and prosperous kingdom, and I felt that I had to go somewhere else and bring the blessing of Abada to someone who really needed it. It will take quite a long time for Drizzen to recover and become an unfailing stronghold once again. I will do my very best to help. You're an a uh, Asimar if I'm not mistaken. I am. Just as you are one yourself. Every time I meet another Asima it feels like meeting family. I look exactly like my great-great-grandmother, but I am the only one among my kin to have Asima blood manifest so visibly in my appearance. I have to admit that it is a very fortunate coincidence, my Asima features are rather appealing and make people trust me more easily. This is a good quality to have for a priestess wishing to gather a congregation. I see that you have constructed an altar of Abada. So I have. 
and before you ask me why I did this when there is a temple of Iome de Indrazan, I will answer. Even though my god is the ally of the inheritor, some still prefer to pray and trust in Abadar instead of her. After all, my humble altar is no worse at removing the corruption of the abyss than the grandiose altar in the temple of Iome de. Fair enough. I have to go. Um, How can I? Alright, uh, let's check inside here. I can handle it. I'm gonna save. Can't make the demons wait. This place has been sanctified, it can protect the area around it from corruption of the abyss. Beautiful. Nerosian, published by the Royal Court of Mendev. Demons and their worshippers have long been active in the vicinity of Sarkaris. Even back in the year 4433, the Abyssal Hordes and Aroden himself waged a grand battle in the region now known as the World Wound. The forces of good had triumphed then, as the God of Humanity defeated Discari's minions and drove the surviving demons back, straight into the waters of the Lake of Mists and Veils. Why did the denizens of the Abyss have such keen interest in the northern reaches of Avistan? To the dismay of all Mortorkind, Ariel Uvalls answered this question, and has consequently gone down in history as the architect of the world wound and the betrayer of humanity. Born of humans, this fiend felt such hatred toward her own kind and was filled with such boundless selfishness that, for the sake of ascension and power, she pledged herself to the Abyssal Lords. An adept of the arcane jailed by the Sarkarians in the prison fortress of Threshold, she accomplished something that the Discarites who perished in the lake had failed at previously, she ripped apart the planar fabric that had been thin in Sarkaris since days of yore. Her thought and will thoroughly corrupted to mirror the foulest depths of the abyss, Ariel Uvalls forged a deplorable alliance with Discari and began hatching the heinous plan that she put into motion in the year 4606. It was then that Aurelia and her accomplices performed the ritual that cut open creation itself like a knife and left a festering tear in the material plane that would never heal, the world wound connecting Gularion with the Abyss. By a tragic coincidence or perhaps by some evil intent, the world wound was created mere weeks after Aroden's death. Millions of Aroden's followers and priests across the world were filled with the horror and despair normally reserved to orphaned children partially explaining why humanity did not realize there and then the sheer threat of the newly opened Sarkarian portal. Taking advantage of turmoil in the mortal world, Discari drove his forces to attack the defenseless Sarkaris, and Aurel Uvals, who had been rewarded for her betrayal, started on her path toward demonic existence. Yeah. Uh, history of the world ruin that was... Um... Plus one bonus inside of law and religion, law, nature. Yeah. Getting these things up a fair bit in these books. Pieces. Some chance what uh hmm uh who has it you no oh, I have it on me uh hmm okay um hmm. Alright, we'll have to save 
waves coming. Stuck. Let's see what we can do. Oh, that's I knew. The active Once they saw their leader's sword broken by dark magics, the soldiers wavered. A murmur shook their ranks and many fell to their knees heralding this as an ill omen that foretold of their inescapable deaths at the hands of the undead. And Iomade thus spoke, For as long as my will is strong and my faith immaculate, no arcane shade shall stop me. And the inheritor raised the hilt with the shattered blade before her, and illuminated herself with a Roden's holy sign, and began her prayer to her divine patron. And as each word escaped her lips, the soldiers' hearts were filled with grace and faith. Their weary bodies had their strength restored, and the lurking shadows were cast out of their souls. Her prayer finished, I o made a, a light with a Roden's blessing once more, thus spoke, I swear it on my life that my resolve to bring justice to the unholy will not falter while the evil of the whispering tyrant devours Gularion, and my hand will not rest until every last minion of Tarbaffin falls to the ground, unmoving. And with these words spoken, I o made a placed her hand glowing with light, upon the broken blade, and in that instant, her righteous wrath and her pure heart reforged the blade whole once more, and thus did she perform the sixth of her eleven feats of greatness. Uh, the Axe of a uh, what do I like that? Plus one bonus of saving throws against disease and sickness. Here we go. What brings you here? I'm nothing new with you. Can't make the demons wait. stuff and throw it up
Let's see what we can do. Here we go. I can handle it. Can't make the demons wait. Beautiful. Let's see what we can do. Here we go. I can handle it. Can't make the demons wait. Ember is bobbing her head and humming a tune. So go. The elf watches you with a radiant smile as you leave. Let's see what we can do. Here we go. Wasn't Stalton's body supposed to be put here somewhere? Or is that it? Ah, yes, it is. Now, how do I do this?
Salut. Maybe I can't resurrect him yet. I have to check up that. I can handle it. Uh, should I do that now? Like her wall yet. Yeah. Can't make the demons wait. Good afternoon, Commander. My pleasure. Not for me with you yet. <laughs> Beautiful. Let's see what we can do. I'm listening, Knight Commander. Are you aware of my special powers? Horgus answers acidly. You mean do I know that you dabble in forbidden magics, resurrecting the dead here and there, as if the crusade was blessed by Urgava rather than Iomade? Yes, I've heard rumors to that effect. Ah. Personally, I couldn't care less. If the crusaders cannot deal with the problem, then let the undead deal with it. Orchalaxian devils hand in hand with Katapshi gnolls. All of them together are better than the demons. As long as your army is on the offensive, I will sponsor it, and I don't care how you spend my gold. Beer and pork or embalming potions. 
Okay. A short, chubby two effling with a golden eye patch spits chewing tobacco between his feet and takes another pinch from a tobacco box adorned with jewels. A fine day to you, Commander. Welcome to the One-Eyed Devil's Trading House. His proud manner suggests that each word begins with a capital letter, and perhaps even continues in capital letters as well. A trading house is just a shop. Ah, uh, that depends. There was a time when I had nothing in my pockets but holes. But did I consider myself poor? No. I considered myself a rich man who was temporarily down on his luck. Optimism is important not only on the battlefield, Commander. You are the leader of a victorious army that will be chopping all the demons into mincemeat sooner or later. I am the owner of a trade empire, which, as you see, is only starting to grow. How did a tiefling end up on the side of the Crusaders? The answer is simple, the simplest thing there is. This is a good world, and I like living in it. Besides, it's the only one we've got. I'd love to know what's going on in the heads of the dimwits who are helping the demons destroy it. My best guess is that their horns grow inward, so there's no room for brains. I'm from Chiliax. Two Flings don't surprise anyone there. And they don't like demons any more than we do here. And why should they? The gods went to all the trouble of creating this world. Even Lord Asmodeus and his devils helped with the construction. And now these freeloaders show up after all the hard work is done, just to gorge and break things. It doesn't matter who you pray to, if you want to live, it's your duty to help. Isn't it a risky name for a store for crusaders? Ah oh yes, a week doesn't go by without some dimwit boiling over. Well, they don't pay me to explain the difference between allies and enemies, devils and demons, Lord Asmodeus and all the riffraff like Baphomet and Discari. So they can go hang. The two effling spits between his feet and swiftly places another pinch of chewing tobacco in his mouth. Here's what I think, you like it, you buy it. You don't like it, keep moving. If you're spoiling for a fight, take yourself off to the tavern. Hmm. Why are your prices so high? We're saving the world for demons and that's included to you. That's some claim. Did you hear that, good people? First of all, my prices are perfectly fair. They're no higher than you'd find anywhere else. Second, who's saving who here? Are you prepared to eat bark and fight with rocks and sticks? You know, I have open contracts with dozens of suppliers. I arrange deliveries and do whatever it takes to get you sharper weapons, better magical items, better food, and you're throwing the extra expense in my face. This is the thanks I get for honest work. <laughs> oh, okay, heard you. Uh, what happened to your eye? Heh, should I make up a story about a heroic fight with a horde of demons? Truth be told, this is how it happened. Back when I was a snot-nosed kid, I had just opened my first business selling pies on the street. The local lads quickly took notice of me, and offered me protection in return for a small share of profits. The usual, you know. But I was so young, inexperienced, and greedy, so I told them to bugger off. Well, they caught me and taught me a lesson. They took it too far, though. I paid for the lesson with my eye, not just bumps and bruises. It's funny to remember it now, but back then while it was happening I was so scared. I thought they'd beat me to death. I remember I came running home in tears, and my mom just started screaming. I didn't have a clue why, and then I looked in the mirror and saw there were just shreds and mush where one of my eyes should be. I've remembered that lesson all my life. Ever since that day, when I start a business, I find some reliable business partners first. 
If I'd been born in a merchant family, my parents would have warned me about this, and about plenty of other things too. But I was a poor lad, so I had to learn everything the hard way. It's a miracle how many times I escaped death by a hair's breadth. In fact, it's lucky all I lost was one eye. I can afford a new eye now, of course. But you know, I just can't find the time. It will cost a tidy sum, and I don't want to take it out of the earnings. And besides, being the one-eyed devil is a big selling point for me. I'd be a fool to get my eye back only to have to keep it hidden under a patch. Have you heard about my new powers? What do you th make of them? Your powers are nothing but misery and ruin. How does a merchant survive in an undead army? They don't need anything. But it's a good thing, I suppose. At least necromancers always need magic ingredients. I'll have to change my stock before your divine powers bring me to ruin. The two effling winks at you with his only eye. What you've done is actually pretty brave, dealing with the undead. Many will object. But as long as you keep winning and pushing the demons back into the world wound, no one will rise to stop you. Officially. Unofficially, I'm sure they'll eat you alive the instant you let your guard down. At least you don't have to expect attacks from your own guard. You can't bribe a dead man. Yeah, show me your wares. Uh, nothing. No gifts there. Um. <laughs> Here we go. In the year 4606, the expanses of Sarkaris were tainted by the swollen abscess of colossal proportions that was the world wound, a tear between Gularion and the abyss that led thousands upon thousands of demons onto the material plane. In the long years that followed, the Kelids of Sarkaris either fled or fell, outmatched, while fighting for their home. In the year 4622, the Church of Iomede announced the beginning of the First Crusade, a blessed war against the demons that had destroyed Sarkaris and now threatened neighboring lands. Valiant warriors, led by Queen Galfrey herself, pushed the abyssal servants away from their borders and returned home victorious. The year 4630 marked the end of the First Crusade. Numerous fortresses and garrisons were established in those years in former Sarkarian lands the outposts duty-bound to watch over Mendev's borders. After eight years, in 4638, the world wound suddenly expanded to four times its previous size, unleashing new monstrous hordes. The worst of the blows suffered by the Crusaders was the loss of Drizzen, a fortress city that used to serve as a base for many a military operation. The Second Crusade was called, which claimed countless lives, yet never resulted in victory. Only with the creation of the Wardstones was the demon invasion stopped, as the Lucent Iomedes magic stood as an impenetrable wall, blocking the invader's path. In the year 4645, after seven years of arduous and mirthless war, the Second Crusade came to an end. The Third Crusade was declared in 4665, but this time, the Crusaders were fighting a war within their own ranks as well. Over the years, many abyss-serving cultists and spies had found their way past Mendevian defenses. 
the Third Crusade reached the apex of an inquisition that mercilessly purged heresy and demon worship by fire and sword. The Crusade was called off in 4668, after the atrocities of interrogators had provoked sufficient upheaval and discontent among the populace. The Fourth Crusade was instigated by demons in the year 4692, when they broke through the protective barrier of the Ward Stones. With righteous fury, the champions of Mendev fought the demons for 15 years, aiming to put an end to the old threat. But by the conclusion of the Fourth Crusade, which ended in 4707 due to a shortage of supplies and manpower, decisive victory was just as remote a possibility as it had been for all of the previous Crusades. Alright, 10 hit points. I got that, okay. I can handle it. The demons wait. Congratulations on taking Drizzen, Commander. It's a great victory, though you paid for it with much blood. Its smell still hangs in the air. I remember the smell well. The last time the air reeked like this was the most horrible day of my life. That day I nearly caught the spinner of nightmares. Hila's gaze grows heavy. It was six months ago. We got a lead where to look for her, a lonely inn along the road. Tell me this. The they wouldn't stop fighting even after their guts were dragged. Yeah. Good luck. Watch your back. Only trust your closest friends. Um. The enemy is cunning and treacherous. Some nobles trying to con peasants into something. Some treasure. Mm. Ah. So, the experiment. Nino gestures excitedly. I will need some supplies for this one. Boy, please bring me a bottle of alcohol. Any will do. And please hurry up, science can't wait. Uh, why do you need alcohol? I've already told you, it's for an experiment. Hurry up and bring it to me. What kind of experiment? This will be an experiment of a personal nature. Nino seems sheepish. But no less exciting for that, mark my words. Why don't you go buy a bottle yourself? I am busy with an extremely important task, mentally preparing myself for the experiment. Besides, a task like this is a perfect fit for my loyal follower. Alright, I bought you a bottle of alcohol for you. Nino snatches the bottle out of your hands and stares at it with all the covetousness of a seasoned alcoholic. 
Here it is, my path to learning the true values of humanity from the perspective of the lowliest man on the street. She produces a corkscrew from her sleeve and looks at it in bafflement, then at the bottle, then at the corkscrew again. After which she hands the bottle back to you. Open it. This experiment definitely won't work if we don't open it. Do you always carry a corkscrew up your sleeve? Don't be preposterous. But I am always meticulous when it comes to preparing for my experiments. I plan for every eventuality, Nino sighs. All right, I admit it, that's not true. But I have truly prepared for this particular experiment. What is this exper experiment going to be about? I'm taking a huge risk with this experiment. I'm putting my reputation, my good name, and even my future on the line. With the help of this bottle, I will lower myself to the level of the average man on the street, and I will try to understand the mentality of someone wholly devoid of intelligence. You surely know, maybe even from personal experience, that alcohol dampens mental activity and is a catalyst for stupidity. With a brain like mine, alcohol is the only way to find out how it feels to be an idiot. Yeah. You're talking as if you've never tried alcohol before. I haven't. I never saw the point of it. So you're asking me to be a drinking buddy? Not at all. I'll do the drinking alone. Your role in this experiment will include standing here and providing me with a visible reaction to my inevitable temporary degradation. Okay. Uh, uncomfortable, well, fine, let's get started. Well, let's begin. With the steely resolve of a warrior going to his last battle, Nino takes a big gulp straight from the bottle. Ack. What? Ah, uh, that's disgusting. After she overcomes the urge to vomit, she looks at you with teary eyes. How do you all drink this? I have no idea what I hope gave you. I am doing this for the sake of science. Another gulp. Oh, ah, uh, that should be enough. You, now, am I stupid yet? Quick, ah, uh, ask me about something smart. Um, hmm. Uh, how many arcane schools are there? PFFF8, of course, transmutation, abjuration, enchantment, illusion, and so on. By the way, did you know that there is one more so-called universal or common pseudo-school, and the disputes about the status of this school are capable of turning a quiet old university professor into a growling, spitting barbarian? Home. It would appear I am not drunk enough yet. Nino takes another swig from the bottle. Right. Mm. It seems to be working. Now. I need to come up with an idea right now, I usually have a ton of ideas. Let's see now. Discari. And Baphomet. Their anti-crusader alliance is not effective enough. They need to unite their forces on the physical level. Baphomet needs to mount Discari and ride him into battle, two in one. Okay. Yes. The experiment was successful. I am definitely drunk. She takes another gulp from the bottle to further confirm her condition. So how does it feel to be drunk for the first time in your life from a scientific point of view? Terif, hick. I have definitely become more stupid. More than that. I am as dumb as a box of rocks and right now I don't give a rat's ass about science. Wait, I think I've got it. That's how men on the street see science. They don't give a rat's ass about it. 
who cares how many arcane schools were recognized by some Absalom professors. Arcane schools are over there, Nino says with a vague wave of her hand. Whereas the bottle is right here, where it belongs. Congratulations, I guess. Now what? That's it for now. The uh, hick. Experiment was a success. Just a moment, I'll. Nino stares at you with glazed eyes, shakes her head, and exhales loudly. When she meets your gaze again, her eyes are crystal clear. All right. I'm fine now. Uh, what was that? What was what? A moment ago you were drunk as a skunk and now all of a sudden you're stone cold sober. Is that so? Nino looks at the bottle in her hand, thoughtfully licks her lips and nods. It seems that is indeed what happened. Clearly, I decided to forget the incident entirely, because I no longer need this information. What I need now is to write an article for the encyclopedia about the influence that alcohol has on an individual's mind. So you can simply forget you were drunk and sober up just like that? I have simply blocked the deleterious effects of alcohol from my mind. To put it in basic terms, I just forgot I'd consumed alcohol. The mechanism is similar to the one that I use to get rid of irrelevant memories. It's not overly complicated, if you know how to do it. Your abilities are just amazing. Hey. What? What were we talking about? Alright, Happy, I could help. On behalf of future generations, I formally thank you for your assistance in this momentous experiment. Now I have time to answer your questions. Come on, ask away. Um, what's the little thing? Home. Mine. That's it. Uh. Beautiful! Alright. These people stop talking as well. I have no idea what else. A tall, pale skinned elf with greyish hair salutes. Uh, Good fortune to you. To you. Uh, a jewelry stool. I can handle it. Welcome to the shop of Derek Sunhammer. The finest jewelry in all of Mendev. True artistry. Crafted by the master himself and his apprentices. Take a look. Uh, huh. Absolute junk. Look at my diamonds from here, though. So that's just kind of useful. Can't make the demons wait. Beautiful. Let's see what we can do.
Here we go. The boy sitting on the counter looks about 18. He salutes you with dignity, though his eyes scarcely rise from the tavern's ledger. The knight commander at my establishment. What an honor. My name is Fikito, I'm the owner of the half measure. How should I address you? I ask because some don't like undue familiarity, while others scoff at the tediousness of ceremony and titles. You may call me my name. Deal. I know your name, of course. Who Indrazen doesn't? So what can I do for you? Wine, a meal, a heart-to-heart -heart talk. Let me see what you have to offer. Um, Deception. That's expensive though, I can't afford it. Helps, okay, archery too. Hmm. I think I have to look at buying them. Eh? Yeah, Will I get enough? I don't have that recipe. Right. What else you have to say? sitting on the counter, swinging his legs. Upon seeing you, he waves. Greetings, Lunacal. How is it that such a young lad owns a tavern? Before the Siege of Drizzen, the half-measure belonged to a distant relative. I won't bore you with the details of how his family died. Just three words, demon worshippers and sacrifice should be enough. Now that the city has been liberated, the authorities and Iomedes church will be returning what remains to the lawful heirs of the deceased. They take these things seriously in Mendev. Fi suddenly slaps himself on the forehead. We started talking about the inn, and I remembered. I wanted to thank you for personally defeating the demon in this very tavern when the city was liberated. Without you, who knows how many glasses he would have smashed before the crusaders got to him. So please accept my thanks from the bottom of my heart. Everything grand for killing a demon in the hobby? Okay, um... The Half Measure is a strange name for a tavern. Oh, that's a family story. It's not for the faint-hearted, but you're not one of those, are you? One day, before the ward stones were erected, a peasant family got lost on the way to the fair, and ended up near the borders of the World Wound. They stumbled upon a bored demon, who killed the father right away. He then asked the mother if she'd prefer him to take all her children or only half of them. The sobbing woman looked at her three darlings and said, half. The demon promptly cut the arms and legs off all the three children, said, I guess that's even and disappeared. People across Drizen heard this story, after the family found shelter at the local temple of Iomade. For many years, they saved up for a regeneration spell so the children could be made whole again. They eventually scraped together enough for just one scroll, and decided to give the youngest child a second chance at life. He soon became the tavern's first owner, and called it the half measure in memory of his family and the terrible incident with the demon. He had a good life, for a time. 
got himself married, and always planned to help his brother and sister, though he never got a proper chance. When the demons had Drizzen surrounded, the poor cripples tried to run for their lives, but they died on the spot. The brother and his wife died a little later, at the hands of deserters. There were rumors that the same demon that butchered the family came to Drizzen and made a den of the half measure. If that's true, I guess he got what he deserved when you freed the city. That's the story. Fi shrugs pensively. Uh, why do you like sitting on the counter? Two reasons, Fi says seriously. Drizzen isn't the biggest city, but it still has a few taverns and pubs. To compete with the others, I need people to remember my establishment, and myself. That's the first reason, a tavern keeper who sits on the counter definitely sticks out from the others who prefer to stand behind their bars, all dignified. Believe me, you're not the first one to ask. Sooner or later every customer does. Not the only tavern or pub, it's something like an enter. Other than in, that can serve up. The second reason is the place's atmosphere. People should feel relaxed here. Life near the world wound is hard enough. Folks don't go to taverns looking to cause each other more trouble. So I allow certain liberties, myself included. I'm even thinking of hosting an invigorating brawl here on the 5th of every month. I'll let my favorite customers break glasses and swing on the chandelier. Uh, what's the feeling here in the city? I can only tell you about my customers. They're mostly working folks, the ones who are rebuilding what's been destroyed, along with soldiers and some merchants. Overall, spirits are high, as high as they can be in Mendev, nation of rattling sabers and fluttering banners. Everyone loves it when the demons get their horns, tails, and other parts handed to them. They've already forgotten that we nearly lost Ken Arbras. War is like that. People live for one day, and that day is tomorrow, not yesterday. You've been a source of joy and inspiration for everyone as well. A simple lad, leading the fight against the demons, and defeating them. And running rings round all the arrogant queen's knights, ha ha. People like stories like that. I'm glad to hear that I'm a source of hope and inspiration. You know what my mother used to say, back when she was alive? Little smiles grow into big victories. Let's drink to that. Another round on the house. Uh, what do your customers say about my new powers? The lad shrugs. The kinds of things people say at a tavern. Some folks say you're just a dolled up corpse, bossing the other corpses around. Others say you've been sent here from Jub to build a kingdom of death. There's even a rumor that you're an immortal like. But most folks say that Iomay Day blessed the Fifth Crusade and sent you her power. The demons have done such evil here that even the dead cannot rest in their graves. The hour of reckoning is near, and you are its weapon. That's what they say. And I can see what they mean. Uh, I have to go, so long. Come again. You will always be welcome here. Fi nods and immerses himself in his calculations once more. Uh, Fi's. Come again. You will always be welcome here. Uh. Fi nods and immerses himself in his calculations once more. How can I help you? Uh... I'm asking this him again. Alright, who are you? Don't you remember our last meeting? The name is Greybor. 
I'm an assassin for hire. But I suspect you're not here for small talk. Are you in need of my services? Uh, we already met in Canabras, didn't we? Uh... Yes, I had a contract to assassinate a rather overconfident demon named Kylos there. I guess that counts as participation in the Siege of Canabras. Not that my employer had any interest in the actual outcome of the battle. Come to think of it, the information my client provided me with was almost suspiciously accurate. They seemed to be aware both of the impending attack on Canabras and of the fact that Kylos was going to be there. Uh, you tried to kill a huge demon at the Battle of Drizzen. Oh, you failed. What happened? Yes, that was a failure. It was supposed to be a clean job. An anonymous client, a worthy target, a substantial fee. But the client insisted that I use an enchanted dagger they provided. I was assured that a single hit would be enough to finish the job, but it didn't work as expected. It was a serious blow to my reputation. And my reputation is everything to me. Uh, I want to hire you for a dragon hunt. A large adult female? The one that's been snatching people and carrying them off? I've heard about her. That's an impressive target. I can take this job, but only if we do it soon. I'm expecting a new assignment from my regular client. And I'll have to leave as soon as I have the orders. And of course, you should know that this dragon will not come cheaply. Two and a half thousand gold, paid in advance. Mm. All right. I'll pay. Excellent. Let's get down to business. It's no easy thing to take down a dragon when you don't have wings, so you'll need to follow my lead. The best thing would be to catch her by surprise in her lair, but we need to find it first. Of course, since she doesn't leave tracks, that might be tricky, but I think I have a solution. We need to go west of Dresden, to the Grimwood Forest. Okay. The dragon's been seen there often. According to the scouts, this is likely because there's still some wild game left in those parts. We'll set up an ambush there. I hope I can rely on your honesty. I understand that on our way to the dragon, there may be other fights or places we need to visit for various reasons. That's to be expected. However, should I see that you are deliberately delaying the contract, or that you're dragging me off to assault some demon citadel instead of going after the dragon, we will have to revise the terms of our agreement. Okay. Won't be doing that for a while, I... Um, hopefully that's not a problem. Alright, we're done with everyone, I think. Let's go inside the castle, <coughs> the main area of the castle. Uh, uh he's got levels to do. Um, all right, Let me bring that up. First level. Uh, athletics. Mobility. And stealth. Um, 
perception also, but you have enough skill points. combat. Um, greater two weapon fighting. I won't worry about gear on him yet. Ah, what's this? A middle-aged paladin with a genial face offers you a guarded greeting. His sparse grey hair stands in fuzzy tufts on his head, giving him a distinctly unwarlike appearance. The ever-bright crusaders have arrived to defend Drizzen. My name is Sia Kabilan, and I am their commander. Queen Galfrey is gathering the main attack forces in Nerosian. She ordered us to replenish the losses suffered in Kenabras and come here. We will support your troops. A tall, dark-eyed lad is standing behind Sia. He passionately echoes Sia's words, we are ready to go to the front immediately. Allow us to be at the spear of the attack. The old crusader calls the young man to order. Mortveg. Don't speak unless spoken to. Don't worry, no one will be defeating any demons without you. Sia smiles kindly and tussles the boy's hair. Ah, uh, who have you brought with you? Ever bright crusaders mainly, but we have a lot of volunteers who joined us. Those who arrived at the Queen's call but didn't want to sit in Nerosian waiting for the main army to set off. All the hotheads know that the front is here. Sia nods at the boy behind him, the one who's eager to fight. We picked up this one too. He walked to Kenabras with an old sword in his hand and a few copper coins in his pocket. He was going to keep walking, to kill the demons. And then he would probably have laid siege to Threshold, no doubt. The boy's cheeks go pink at the old man's gentle mockery, but he continues to stare ahead resolutely and boldly. Uh, did you fight in Canabras? How are things there? Not personally, no. The Queen summoned me and the bulk of our order to Nerosian. Almost all those who remained behind in Kenabras died, and the ones that didn't were disorganized and leaderless. But the order did not perish. New volunteers have been pouring into our ranks. We are licking our wounds, Kenabras is rebuilding. Life wins out. P. 
people are coming from all over Avistan to help. Many are joining up with the Crusaders, just as it happened back in the First Crusade. Uh, great, you will be serving under my command. Sia's mouth flattens into a hard line and he gives you a stern look. You can see the seasoned warrior hiding behind the grandfatherly guys. That is out of the question. We know about your powers, and that is why we don't trust you. Okay. What's more, I'm convinced you are an enemy of the Crusaders. You will reveal your true nature sooner or later. Okay. The Queen ordered us to help you hold the city, and so we will. But she didn't say a word about us personally obeying your orders. The Everbright Crusaders will act independently. Uh, you should not see me as your enemy. Sia lowers his head stubbornly. Arguing is useless. No ever bright crusader will take orders from a person who has darkness in their soul. Alright. I don't really need them at the moment. The old man looks at you grimly. You've gone down the wrong path. You can defeat the darkness when your soul is pure and your heart is daring. Everyone who has ever tried to defeat darkness with darkness has become its slave. Reject this evil power and repent before it's too late. Yeah, you got a lot of time to get for that. Alright. Um, what is my line? Oh, okay. Can you push more towards the door for Regil's pale yellow eyes f Tirabeth. Tirabeth's eyes are vacant, her thoughts are clearly somewhere far away. Seeing you, though, she snaps to attention. Hail, Commander. Uh, solemn hour. Uh, what's she's that? Tirabeth says goodbye with a short bow. Is that the one I put on Sailor? Oh, it is. Damn it. Hmm. All right. Ready uh, uh can't make the demons wait. Who have I got to replace it with? Bone. Mm. 
plus three. That's short. Um, So we have to replace gradients. Uh, got two of these. Tirubetha's eyes are vacant, her thoughts are clearly somewhere far away. Seeing you, though, she snaps to attention. Hail, Commander. Uh, give this Solomon hour of Tirubeth. Um, I found your father's sword, take it. Praise Iomade. Tirubeth takes the sword as gently as if it were a living creature, and sheaths it in the scabbard. I don't know what to say. I am forever indebted to you. I never thought I'd get my sword back. Right. Please, allow me to reward you, and please, no objections. I could never replace this sword. I shall never part with it again, I swear. Alright. Uh, we need to talk about what happened during the attack on Drizzle. Tirabeth nods curtly. Yes. I was shamefully faint-hearted. Praise I Omade, it didn't affect the course of the battle. Still, my behavior was unworthy of a knight, even less a commander. Under the circumstances, leaving my position would be tantamount to desertion. Still, as your advisor, I strongly recommend you release me from my position as head of the order, strip me of my knighthood, and send me to serve in the condemned. You deserved these titles more than you. Don't blame yourself. Under the circumstances, you did everything possible and more. Side. Thank you, Commander. The gratitude in Tirabetha's voice is sincere. A spark of enthusiasm appears in her eyes, which had grown dull over recent weeks. The half orc salutes you sharply. For a moment you once again see the Tirabeth who was ready to protect the defender's heart to her dying breath. Thank you for still trusting me. More than anyone else does in this crusade. Even more than I trust myself. Despite your words, Tirabeth obviously still feels unworthy of her commander's rank. Changing her mind will require more than platitudes. Perhaps you can bolster her by appointing her to a position where she can work more closely with rank and file soldiers, those whose faith in their commander remains undimmed. 
Uh, how is the Eagle Watch doing in Canabras? Everything is going well. I was wary of handing over the reins, at first. I was afraid that everything would fall apart without Anivia and me. But I took a risk and left a very clever lad in charge, a 2 fling, as it happens. He infiltrated the cult alone, they couldn't imagine a 2 fling wouldn't be on their side. He exposed an entire cell. I personally knighted him, just before the city was attacked. Of course, there were many who weren't happy about it, but, it's not my job to make people happy. He hasn't disappointed. He has built up the Order's ranks again and is running everything so smoothly, it's as if the demon attack never happened. He's proven more than once that I left Ken Arbras in good hands. But I admit, it's still strange to think that such a small order as the Eagle Watch now has two chapters, one in Drazen and one in Ken Arbras. Tirabeth says goodbye with a short bow. Alright. In the view of it, so. Look who it is. Hi. Uh, have you figured out how the demons have been sneaking up on us? Anivia answers with scarcely concealed irritation. No dice. Our scouts crawled all over the area, down every hole. Nothing. The grey road was completely empty, and then, bam. A whole army popped up like a jack in the box. My only lead is a few scouts who didn't come back from the gorges to the southwest. But we've found no sign of secret paths or underground passageways, and definitely no route we can use to quietly move a large force through. But I feel it in my gut, there's some evil scum out there. We just have to look harder. Of course, I could send out more scouts, but they might just disappear like the first ones. Why don't you go there yourself and find out what's what? Uh, what do you think of my new powers? Anivia looks at you sadly. There's nothing good about this. The things you've had to do, and the fact we're fighting alongside the dead because we'll never pull this off without them. But at least we're moving forward, not falling back like before. I guess it was the only way. Bad times call for bad measures. Did you find out anything about where, uh, Ming Megada, yeah, that team lady went? Anivia shakes her head sharply. Nope. Zero. Zilch. A whole lot of nothing. The scum melted into thin air. Soldiers saw her jump out the window, run through the square in front of the citadel, and suddenly disappear. We haven't heard anything from her since. And I don't like it. I'm telling you, this is bad. First of all, her kind don't just give up. If we can't see her, it means she's setting a trap for us somewhere we won't expect. I mean, it would be great if the demon lords just gobbled her up for all her failures. But I think that's too much to hope for. But that's not the worst part. We have a more interesting question, you know. I wonder how she teleported from the city, if by that time you'd already hung the banner. The soldiers are saying it probably wasn't in full force by then, but you and I both know that's dross. She wasn't supposed to be able to teleport. But she did. The question is, how? You had help. Alright. You watch yourself now. Uh... Alright, let's look at this Crusader Affairs. And then hopefully we're done with all this talking. For a while. Um... Let's...
I don't even know what my current is. Do I want to do that? Hmm. Why is the things built here already?
Welcome. Okay. Plus, uh, Got to build.
I'm gonna do it then. This be my dead army, I guess. And now. A gang of cutthroats who sold their conscience for demon gold has been destroyed. Their chief, a battle-hardened, scar-ridden mercenary laden with valuable artifacts is hanging in the noose. The trophies he received for murder will come in useful for the Crusaders.
warriors have discovered what attracted such a horde of monsters, an impressive ambulant laboratory belonging to some insane alchemist. The laboratory had been mercilessly plundered and the jars of elixirs and ingredients bore sinister holes through which the hideous creatures had consumed their contents like some exquisite nectar. Luckily, some of the alchemist's inventory survived and now belongs to the Crusaders. some income style income Daily, daily. Uh, I think I just went. The Crusaders killed the cultists who were gathering an army of wild giants to storm Drizzen. Now that Drizzen is safe, workers can be transferred from the urgent strengthening of the walls to other important tasks. Did 
Oh, look, one nine. Look who it is. Hi. All right. You watch yourself now. Tirubeth is up. Tirubeth says good. Regil's pale. Let's see what we can do. Actually. What's going on here? Here we go. I can handle it. What's this? I'm so quiet. I right. put time up. It's Crusaders. The Crusaders are here. The, oh, the abyss must be. Would I be down to do that if I was sneaking? Mm. Out of my sight! Thank <laughs> you. 
Can't make the demons wait. Let's see what we can do. Let's prove their logic is lacking. Last one for me. <laughs> Did you see that? I will. Can't make the demons wait. Beautiful. Let's see what we can do. Here we go. I'll make short work of no this. No time for debates. Mind on the muscle. <laughs> What's that there? Trust me. 
they will not expect my strike. The spirits guide me. I am helpful, am I not? I hope you appreciate this. Now what is that? I can handle it. I am helpful, am I not? Can't make the demons wait. Am I not? Here comes trouble. That woman is corrupted. Kill the heretics. May they know the power of the great titan, the true masters of this world. Today's sacrifice! You've crossed the wrong mongrel. I can. We'll witness, one way or the other. What's going on here? Are we ready to move out? Snap, air, orma. Oh, 
skip the pleasantries. Missed me already. Are we in trouble yet? Open your heart to me. Fighting for a righteous cause is certainly different from a simple massacre. Bloody and performed with pinkies out. Anything new? Yes. I'm all ears. Well, together we stand. Let's see what we can do. Deception chip file. Perception check. Uh, I don't know what the perception check was, but we'll redo it.
We will win this war. I am here all week. Oh, the waiting's never fun. Beautiful. The light take you. Yet another obstacle. Perception check here. See what we can do. Here we go. We'll win this. One way or the Fighting for a righteous cause is certainly different from a simple massacre. The Warrior. former is more bloody and performed with pinkies out.
Chasing elementals away to their home planes, crusaders find a huge crystal filled with magical energy. It appears that it was imbued with the elemental force many years ago and convoyed to Drizzen but never arrived. Its guards have perished, and the crystal itself, a powerful vessel of magical essence, has been drawing elemental spirits year after year.
the fortress was a sanctuary for spellcasting demonologists. The fire that started during the battle spread to the libraries filled with blasphemous knowledge. The glow of this massive fire lights up the dark expanses for miles around. A gang of demons hunting runaway slaves was not reckoning on facing the commander's conquering forces. Among the bloody corpses, the crusaders discovered a dark godforsaken altar fashioned from the teeth of demons captured victims and the webs of the monstrous mechanical spider retrievers. The soldiers clamored to burn it but the more tactically minded officers decided not to rush into anything and passed it on to the commander for examination.
Begging for mercy, one of the imprisoned demons points at an inconspicuous crack in the rock that their unit had been ordered to guard until the arrival of a pack of slaves. Examining the crack, the crusaders return to the commander and proudly display a handful of shining dust to him. The crevice is home to an adamantine load. This rare and precious metal will come in useful to the Mendevian army. During the First Crusade, the Radiant Saranra performed a miracle here, granting the Crusaders victory in a battle that was otherwise lost. Years later, during the Second Crusade, 
the Knights of Mendev clashed with the army of the Abyss here once again. They fought to the bitter end, but the miracle was not repeated. The carnage was atrocious, and those who fell found no repose, rising again as undead. Now they have found peace in the flames of bonfires. The Crusaders cleansed the blood and dirt from the statue of the Sun Goddess, lifting with trembling hands the sacred golden symbol from her chest, a relic long believed to have been lost. Before you stands a tall, fit man whose dark hair is already tinged with grey. He greets you with a brisk military salute. My name is Captain Silkind. I command the vanguard of a mercenary group called the Blackstone Company. We've come from Andoran to assist you. Uh, I want to know more about your unit. The Blackstone Company is proud to be recognized as one of the finest Andoran mercenary regiments. We are not a bunch of unscrupulous cell swords looking to oppress the innocent and serve the tyrants of the world. No, we're adventurers eager to get involved in a dangerous enterprise and leave it with pockets full of gold, and a clear conscience. Which is why we held a vote among our units. We were glad to accept Queen Galfrey's invitation to join the Crusade, though some of our commanders, ahem, did voice their displeasure with the sum she offered. But like I said, we Andorans are a free people who cannot be pushed around and who cannot be bought, only convinced. Uh, why did you join up with us? Queen Galfrey paid for our services, but please do not think we are fighting for gold alone. We are true sons and daughters of Andoran, so the ideals of equality and resisting enslavement ring true in our hearts. We will be glad to stand in the way of demons who seek to force more Torkind into bondage. The bulk of our company made camp in Nerosian, but the vanguard, consisting of our finest soldiers, if I may add, was put under your command. Uh, I want to know more about you, Captain Skelkarn. The man flashes a genuine smile. I don't even know what to say. I am a soldier, a bit of an explorer, and just an all-around honest man. Uh, uh, get on with your duties. Yes, sir. Glad to be under your command. Captain Silkind salutes you again, smiles and adds in a softer voice, it will be an honor to serve with you, Commander. If you have any questions, let me know. If you need to talk, I'd be happy to lend an ear. Okay. Tirabeth said that we're under threat from demons with unusual abilities. Like that Nabasu that attacked your army at the Lost Chapel. They're very powerful and they're growing in number. You haven't found out where they're coming from, have you? 
Erua Shaley looks around shyly and continues, lowering her voice, as if entrusting you with a personal secret. I think I... I'm not sure, but... I think I have a lead. I know where to find someone who can lead us to the source of their power. Uh, who are you talking about? A hag by the name of Jeru Yunika. She used to live here before the fall of Sarkaris, but when the demons invaded this world, she happily took their side. The old cannibal knows many secrets, you just have to make her talk. <laughs> okay. Um... Does this Jermaka also have special powers? Oh, I doubt it. But still, be careful, she is a very old, very sly creature, and she's incredibly dangerous. Hmm. Where can I find this informer of yours? The place is called the Green Gates. I'll show you how to get there. Long ago, before the world wound, there was a Sakurayan fortress there. Then Crusaders built a small chapel. But for many, many years the place has been home to nothing but abomination and squalor. Uh, how did you find out about this? Erua Shaley quickly looks at the faces of those present and seems to curl in on herself. Quietly, almost whispering, she says, that is, a long story. I will tell you when we get there, alright? Uh, thanks for the tip. Happy to help. It's just, Erua Shaley looks around cautiously again and lowers her voice. You won't go there without me, will you? I want to personally make sure this monster doesn't escape you. Yeah. Grandma Gretel lowers herself into a bow. Good day, your commandership. It is we, the artistic board of the next door theater. We are still working on our piece about your heroism. We have even taken on a few new crew members, we now have a master of stage equipment and scenery. It's my granddaughter Tina. Tina, say hello to his commandership. Went for their play. We are faced with another dilemma. We simply can't decide on a climactic moment for the act that's all about the Battle of Drizzen. No. Here, you listen to the options. Grandma Gretel holds a scroll up before her eyes and begins to read, running a gnarled finger along each line. Why can't they? They've got Canabra still in it. That's what they said they were going to do. Option 1. The commander, so that's you, launches himself out of a catapult and smashes down the fortress wall, allowing the armies to rush inside. Option 2. The commander, so that's you again, masquerades as a succubus and creeps into Drizzen in disguise, and then opens the gates to the Crusaders. Option 3. The commander, so that's you again, rides to the attack on an enormous mountain goat, or should we call it a battering ram? and it breaks down the city gates. Well, what say you? Um.
I'm torn um, to between number two and three. Cross-dressing as a succubus. Um, or riding on the back of an enormous goat. <laughs> Even one's pretty good. I launch myself out of catapult. Um, hmm. as a succubus, I guess. Yes, it sort of makes it a performance within a performance. Theatre in the theatre. A double entendre in a double entendre. Oh, I think I misspoke. Thank you for the inspiration, your commandership. Grandma Gretel and her entourage move away, but their voices project so well that you can easily hear the rest of the conversation. What do you think? Maybe we can somehow add a catapult to the succubus plot. Maybe the commander can use a catapult to fly out of Drizzen once he's completed his mission. Okay, they want to use a catapult really badly. Did you forget that the role of the commander is being played by a cyclops? How are we going to launch Lampkin out of a catapult? Where are we going to find a catapult that won't just break under his weight? Calm yourself, Tina, right it's choice. just a minor snag. You can't achieve success without a few difficulties along the way. We'll think of something, you'll see. The grim voice of Zashur's the like suddenly booms inside your mind. Oh. Student, you have proven yourself a worthy crusader. To defeat the demons in this war, you have fearlessly sought the secrets of death. Your determination deserves respect. Now we can proceed with your great transformation into a like. For that, I shall need a suitable laboratory where I can scrutinize and condition your spiritual body in solitude, preparing it for rebirth. As for you, you will need a palace from which you will rule over legions of the dead. Give the order to erect a ziggurat in Drizen. A what? Zashurs's imperious voice betrays a hint of vanity. It must be an imposing building, one worthy of receiving me as its guest. This is where you will discover eternal life. If the need arises to demolish a few buildings for the construction, ensure that they are located far enough away from the squalor of the slums. I do not wish for my ingredient stores to be ravaged by rats. Um... Hmm. Is this gonna affect things? Of this choice? No. Let me check this. Because I don't want to take all these evil options. I don't have to. Um.
Uh, I'll go with a good choice, I guess. What do the lives of soldiers matter? Once you have mastered the powers of death, your soldiers will fight for you whether they are alive or dead. Get on with it, student. Alright. The tall, gaunt half-elf salutes you solemnly. Commander. It is an honor to call this first meeting of the military council to order. I am Captain Odan, and I've been serving under your command ever since the assault on the Grey Garrison. I will do my best to be of as much use to you as possible in this role. The foundation of the military is cold calculation and discipline. These are the principles I will seek to impart to the Crusaders. If we are to win this war, we must forget about mercy, for our enemies, for our troops, and for ourselves. Well, Commander, your sister Sela is no renowned general, but she's spent half her life tussling with evil. It looks like I'll be stepping up on behalf of all of Iome Day's faithful here. I hope my advice will prove useful. The first issue on the Military Council's agenda is the reorganization of troops. Our infantry has been bled dry. The forces Her Majesty granted to us were enough to take Drizzen, but we need more troops to hold it. Furthermore, the army was assembled in great haste after the assault on Kenabras and was never adequately equipped. Okay. Unfortunately, we don't have much time for redeployment. Our scouts report that a powerful Baylor, Khoram's aid, is already preparing a retaliatory strike on Drazen. But we can rely on freshly conscripted Mendivian soldiers. They may not have the skill, but our strength, as always, lies in the number and the fervor of the volunteers joining the Crusades. We can't throw everyone into the meat grinder, we'll just get our youths killed for nothing. We need to select the best among the recruits, or even better, hold a contest. The bravest and the most capable will join the Crusaders. The death count is always highest in the infantry, its purpose is to serve as a shield. It would be wise to invest our resources in hiring and training heavy footmen with shields to ensure maximum protection, even if it limits their mobility and makes them less threatening to the enemy. Uh, Captain Odin, what does the Military Council do? The Military Council determines the strategy for our troops, enacts army reforms, approves new equipment standards, and makes decisions on all issues regarding military action on the front lines. Who is... is Baila? The most trusted servant of the Demon Lord Discari. Among the historians of the Mendivian Crusades, he's known as the strategist of the World Wound. He's not as renowned as Minago, the conqueror of Drazen, or Hepzimra, daughter of Baphomet, but he has claimed the most major victories over the forces of Mendev. He's a general and quite possibly one of the best tacticians in the entire abyss. Okay. I've been studying his style of warfare for years. He may seem like an ordinary demon, another typical war taskmaster, but that's a fallacy. Like a beast following a scent, he senses weaknesses in his enemy's defenses and strikes at them, sending soldiers to bring targeted carnage. His uncanny charisma attracts more and more soldiers to him, so he's never short on troops and sacrifices them like pawns whenever he pleases in order to achieve his victories. Khoramzade is the face of the demon host. For many years, I've been gathering research on him, preparing for the day our armies would clash with his once more. I hope my council will help you defeat him, but so far, Khoramzade has known no defeats. I have questions for my advisors. 
We're ready to answer any questions you may have, Commander. Sealoth, you ha have you ever commanded an army before? Not on a scale like this, of course not. But I've fought evil, and I know its tricks. Besides, war makes people callous, and it's always useful to have a paladin advisor around to remind you at a crucial moment what we're actually fighting for, right? Uh, Rigel, why do you wish to sit on the military council? I have command experience, and I intend to impart to the Crusaders at least a modicum of the discipline and rigidity of the Helk Knights. The quality of the Mendevian staff currently available to you leaves much to be desired. Regil glances at the wincing Captain Odan. That much is certain. Who are you, Captain Odin? Captain Odan bows ceremoniously. I've served on the front lines of the Mendevian army for over 25 years, and in that time I've gained a wealth of combat experience. His voice sounds calm, but his face darkens at the mention of a wealth of combat experience. I'm considered one of the foremost experts on tactics and strategy in Queen Galfrey's officer corps. I've spent my whole life studying the craft of warfare, and I'm familiar with the thoughts of all prominent military leaders of the last five centuries. Furthermore, I wholeheartedly believe in the traditions of Mendev's military art, and will gladly share my knowledge with you, Commander. I have no more questions on that. We are glad to be of service, Commander. Um, I want to hear your opinion, the opinions of my advisors. Everyone looks at you expectantly. Sila, do we really need only the bravest and most capable for our infantry? I mean, we can't send untrained rookies to a slaughter. We have the right to command only those who are ready for battle, those who can defeat the enemy. We must find out who has the skill and the guts. Contests are perfect for that, and a little excitement for our warriors couldn't hurt, either. We won't get that many winners but their strength will come from their prowess, not their numbers. Your proposal would leave us with an infantry full of selfish risk-takers dreaming of glory and valor. That is bad material for a soldier. The infantry's role is to be a shield for the archers and mags. All they're required to do is follow orders and hold the line, unto victory or death. Ambitious loners cherry-picked through contests of skill are not fit to perform this duty. Uh, Regal, why do you insist on shield bearers? The infantry is a meat shield intended to catch the blade of the opposing army in its flesh. The shield must be reliable, that is all that is required of it. That is why I would like to see well armored shield bearers as our foot soldiers. We must have the option of pitting ranks of footmen against a tide of rampaging demons, knowing with certainty that they will not scatter or die, until they have completed their task. Uh, Captain Odin, uh, you just you just want to gather up some recruits from Mendev? Yes, institute a draft and try to amass as many new soldiers from Mendev and other lands as we can. We've always drawn our strength from our zeal and our determination to oppose evil. If we start holding contests or selections, we'll turn a holy crusade into a job for the chosen few and scare away future volunteers. If we try changing our tried and true tactics, we'll lose valuable time. And our army is in need of fresh blood right now. Everything is clear to me now. Your advisors nod respectfully in response to your words. Hmm. Okay. Excuse me. Champions. Okay. Excuse me, shield bearers. Do basically no damage, but take heavy damage.
This gives constructs. Uh. Here's a seven. Good thing it's only five. Ooh. Shield ability. I think it stops it. Range attacks are being my archers though. Apparently melee attacks. So this is just cheap units, supposedly. Mm. Oh, these can crit. I think I'll take the champions, really. Because I'll have cheap things from the... the zombies and everything. And... Uh... They're possibly... And I don't think my own units get turned into zombies. I think it's only the enemies. So, what I've seen so far. Mm, yeah. A cheeky smile blossoms on Sila's face. You know, I think I might hit the arena once or twice myself to test the rookies. It'll be a nice warm up. Captain Odan salutes you formally. Thank you for your time, Commander. When the reforms are finished and the ranks of our infantry are replenished, I will assemble the military council to discuss new decisions. Okay. Let's save some adventures for later. A sharp looking kite soon gives you a quick, business like bow. Commander, the matters before us are urgent, so let's not stand on ceremony. I am Lady Economy, the official attach of Nerosian. Here are my credentials. She presents a scroll adorned with Galfrey's seal. Her Majesty has instructed me to lead your headquarters diplomatic council. That's not a kid to me. Uh, he's just like, um, uh, what's her name? 
uh, Ninio. That's the first other Kitsume we've seen. Uh, have we seen. Yes, I've seen any Kitsume so far yet. Um, it's only the second one. Honestly, I was surprised when Lady Konami asked me to join this council. But I will do my best to fill the shoes of a trained diplomat. Yeah. Um, yeah, strange, I got invited to the council too. I'm sure foreign ambassadors will be thrilled to see my face and my manners. <laughs> Lady Konami, you haven't mistaken me for some other crusader lamb, have you? I, like many nobles, have been trained in diplomacy, and, in fact, I hold the title of Royal Emissary, it is passed down the Arunde line. I must say that prior to this day, I employed my diplomatic skills solely to undermine Mendev's international reputation. It is time to break that habit. I imagine preventing international scandals will be just as interesting as causing them. Who knows, I might even enjoy it. That's a lot of people to talk to. Um, what's a dipl my diplomatic council and why do we need it? To solve matters of politics, of course. The crusade is more than just battles and sieges. It is the largest military project in all of Avistan, funded by the treasuries of more than a dozen major powers. And each one of those powers, in addition to seeking victory over the demons, also pursues its own goals. The Diplomatic Council will manage this tangle of political interests, and prevent the Crusade from losing the favor of influential benefactors. And while we're at it, ensure that Nerogian remains satisfied with the state of affairs. After all, for the last hundred years, the entirety of Mendevian politics has revolved around the Crusades in some shape or form. That is why the capital has sent me here to observe, offer suggestions, and keep the diplomatic situation under control. I see. So you've been sent here to keep an eye on me. Whatever gave you that idea, Commander. I'm not an overseer, I'm your loyal advisor. I do not intend to meddle in the way you run things, just consult with you in cases where the price of error is too high. Put your trust in me, and we'll get along swimmingly. Um. After all, Oops. none of us here want to see Chaliax and Druma at each other's throats, trying to settle their dispute by using their influence on us as political leverage. Am I wrong? And I doubt you would like it if we made enemies in the ranks of Nerogian nobility who would attempt to un- soon um tell me more about the royal council what is it the royal council operating under her majesty is the highest governing body in mendev and comprises her most able and trusted servants it is responsible for day-to-day -day matters of state they are the hands and the voice of the queen the council has gathered people from all walks of life some of them are nobles but many more are citizens of humble origins who earned their positions through their wit. Many are rich, but a fair number of them are of more humble means. Some are pious and pure of heart like Lord Inquisitor Cassery and Captain Jasper of the Crusader Heralds. Others are more flexible and ambitious. But each of them faithfully serves Mendev's cause. I have a question about the composition of this council. Do you find someone's presence surprising? So, Seal, uh, you never had to deal with diplomatic concerns before. That won't be a problem. In my homeland, Tionxia, inviting clerics and paladins of Shlin, the Lady of Chrysanthemums, to take part in diplomatic missions is a common practice. They may not be politicians, but they are perceptive, advocate peace, and favor balanced solutions. 
I'm flattered by the respect that the worshippers of my goddess receive in Lady Konami's homeland. So Zil bows his head courteously. I won't let you down, Lunacow, and I'll make every effort to prevent our friends from becoming our enemies. Uh, why did you want Darren to take, Darren to take part in the council? Why, because of Counter and Deus influence, naturally. He's a Mendevian aristocrat, the nobility will be inclined to listen to his opinion. And by ensuring the support of the nobles, we'll find ourselves powerful allies. Dayran sneers back at her. Oh, believe me, Lady Konami, I will exert all my effort and influence to make this council's job exciting. Why did you choose Lan to join the council? We diplomats call this little trick mysterious Garadi Prince. During negotiations, it's always useful to have on your side a representative of some obscure but potentially populous and powerful nation. Without knowing what they are up against and how many mongrels there are, our diplomatic partners will have to contend with this dark horse. So Mr. Lan will be our mongrel prince. If we're negotiating with foreign ambassadors and I make this sign, Lady Konami crosses her fingers in an intricate gesture. You immediately start talking about how offensive their proposition is to the mongrel people. Do we have a deal, Mr. Lan? Uh. Lan scoffs and glowers at Lady Konami. I suspected that the word diplomat was synonymous with fraud but I thought you would be deceiving me, not deceiving others with my help. No, that's not an option. I can represent the mongrels in negotiations, but I'm not going to lie through my teeth. Uh, tell me about yourself, Lady Komi. Who are you? Lady Konami lowers her eyes in a show of modesty. It's unbecoming of a diplomat to talk about themselves at length, but how am I to refuse you? I come from Tiungxia, from the noble Kite Sun. Like any Kite Sun, I have always been curious to a fault, and my adventures brought me to Avistan. And here, in your lands, I met my first and true love politics. I've served as a diplomat in the courts of six different sovereigns, but working for Her Majesty turned out to be the most interesting of all. Such riveting webs of intrigues and interests are spun around the crusade and the world wound. You worked for six different sovereigns. Why'd she leave each one? Uh, to work for someone else each time. The service is not good. Needed anymore or what? Well, it's an ongoing job. Well, everything is clear to me now. In that case, why don't we discuss our first pressing diplomatic issue? What's on the Council's agenda for today? I hate to say it, Commander, but not everyone in Nerosian is pleased with your progress. Some believe that, to use their words, you are out of control and fancy yourself an independent leader. It wouldn't surprise me if you encountered supply disruptions in the near future. I would suggest quelling their anger. Show the capital you haven't forgotten about the chain of command. For example, you could hold a parade in honor of Her Majesty. Huh. If we need to demonstrate that we're keeping Nerosian in mind, why don't we invite the capital's high priest to Drizen for a religious festival? It'll be appropriate, and the church's support will shield us from the accusations of schemers. Mm. Panda to the naysayers. I think not. I propose we hold a parade in your honor, Lunacal. This is your victory, and if cousin Galfrey wants to show off in front of the soldiers, she's welcome to capture something of her own. Lan's eyes flash with anger. Are they out of their mind? We've got a whole dozen full of soldiers who need medicine, food, and weapons. Until everyone has been taken care of, we can't waste a single coin on pointless celebrations. Um. What did I do to incur Neurosyn's dis discontent? You were too good. You reclaimed Kenabras, you won the Battle of Drizen. You're a menace to the world wound. Your authority grows, and the influence of the Queen's confidants diminishes. 
This creates the impression that there's only enough space for you at the top. The members of the Royal Council are afraid that you will muscle them out of the political arena altogether. After all, if you're doing so well, maybe Her Majesty doesn't need them that much. Therefore they might try to discredit you, impede your war effort, reduce the scale of your victories. Make some concessions, and they'll see that you're open to negotiations. I want to hear the opinions of my advisors. Lady Konami gives you a look of surprise. Whatever for. Aren't the wishes of the capital obvious enough? Although, very well, let us hear their counsel. So, so Seal, how does inviting the High Priest to a festival help us? Without a doubt, we should remain loyal to the Queen and respect the hierarchy. But that doesn't mean we have to kowtow to the Royal Council whenever they ask. I think we should neither do their bidding nor seek to quarrel with them. Rather, we should try to take the middle path. The High Priest of Nerosian is a powerful figure, yet he's not a schemer or a politician. By inviting him to the festival, we'll both show that we're not cutting ties with Nerosian and let them know that we have influential friends and are not about to buckle under to the Royal Council. Bayron, what's the point of taunting the capital by throwing a parade in my honor? There is a fine line between taunting and setting boundaries and between showing respect and putting on a collar. Mind you, I'm not suggesting anything treasonous or disrespectful. A parade in honor of the true hero of Drizzen and Kenabras, what could be more natural than that? Besides, a healthy amount of disobedience guarantees that people won't pester you with lectures and nonsense as often. A dozen tutors responsible for my upbringing can attest to that. Provoking the capital would be unwise. We are trying to avoid unpleasant consequences, not expedite them. I'm sure that was merely an extravagant jest on the Count's part. Lan, do you think ignoring the cap uh, capital's worries is a good idea? And what are they going to do about it? We are the ones protecting them from the demons, not the other way around. Having loyalties from the capital is great, but there are more important things, like having the loyalty of our own soldiers. When the demons come, what will we do? Shake our fists and say we've got powerful friends in Nerosian. Why, that's true, who needs to stay friends with those who supply you with provisions, recruits, and weapons? And there's certainly no reason to fear that base jealousy and envy at the sight of your glory might get the better of their common sense. Because that has never happened before. Lady K Kami, what's, what good will a parade in Her Majesty's honor do? It will be symbolic and affordable. Show them how much you respect and value Her Majesty. Make a curtsy to those who pay for your arrows, swords, and bread. The Royal Council has power. You wouldn't want to turn those patrons into adversaries and test whose influence is greater, yours or theirs. Please them, and they will stop worrying about your loyalty. And you will be able to focus on your war. So let me get this straight, hiding behind our backs and buying their safety from the demon invasion with bread and other people's lives is a new form of charity. Are you sure we shouldn't go to them? drop to our knees, and thank them for allowing us to die in this war. Then I will arrange for the organization of festivities in Queen Galfrey's name. What? Um, okay, what's the stuff to do? See, so Seals 1 unlocks, uh, the religious feast. Energy points income increase by 20% and financial points income reduces by 10% for 30 days. Okay. Uh, the Commander's Parade, the cost of recruiting mercenaries reduces by 7.5. Um, material points Income reduced 
25 <coughs> so I get less materials okay and I reduce the cost of mercenaries They're both 45 days which is nice this one's 10 days uh, help in those need crusade morale Increase by 10 or 20 crusade morale is below zero. It'd be good to get up in a row when I need it. Yeah. So this costs me. Uh, Okay, finance points each time. 2,500. Uh-huh. Um, uh, financial point income increased by 10% for 30 days. Uh, hmm. I think they used to buy pickle units later. Socials. moment, Commander. I understand that you're used to being the highest authority in all matters, but political decisions are an exception. I am a professional in this field, you are not. By ignoring my recommendations, you are not only deliberately seeking conflict with the capital, but disregarding common sense as well. I urge you to reconsider. I invited my companions to the diplomatic, diplomatic Council, and now you're refusing to listen to their opinions? I'm simply suggesting that you give your companions time to find their feet in the Council and to grasp the principles of being a diplomat. Also, if they weren't on the Council your decisions could be mistaken for the decrees of a tyrant. And that is definitely not the public image you need. Ah, now I understand the role that I've been given, Lady Economy. I'm supposed to stand in a pretty doublet and keep my mouth shut. I can promise you the former, but not the latter. Do I have to say one of these things? Um... I'm not changing my mind. Um, uh, 
Uh, don't tell me what to do. We're inviting the high priest, that is all. Lady Konami's voice hardens. I cannot challenge your decision. However, I have no choice but to inform the capital that you have disregarded my recommendations. Actions like these are precisely what gave Nerogian cause for concern, Commander. I hope you will revise this defiant stance in future. I'll see to it that the High Priest receives a proper welcome. And let him know that the strength of our faith is just as absolute as our loyalty to Mendev. And with that, we can bring this meeting of the Diplomatic Council to a close. It is unfortunate that things were so... tense. But I'm sure we'll soon have many more opportunities to resolve any misunderstandings between us. Okay. Uh, we done... Uh, horse. Tirabeth. Tirabeth says goodbye with a short bow. Regils. Look who it is. All right. You watch yourself now. Ah. Uh, we have a lot of charm. Saving. All right. I'm going to leave it here. It's going to light. Yeah. Uh.